Now, there is, I suspect, a very special Hitchens archive somewhere out there in some corner of YouTube, so let me know if you find it, will you? Outgrowing religion and leaving this awful uh, nonsense behind. And with that... <laughs> and with that, I think I've realized that if you haven't copped my drift by now, I might as well go and sit in that chair anyway. Very nice of you to come. Thank you. Have a quick drink of water while you yes, can. Now, um, it's uh, like your book. How many minutes was that, by the way? I'd just like to yeah, know. I think it if was. If I guessed it right. I think it was 38. Okay. I cheated them of seven minutes. That's all right. We can talk. But I yield back the balance of my time, as they say in the Senate. <laughs> Let's start, if we can, with a, a portrait of the um, artist as a young contrarian. And I'd like to know, did you ever, as a, as a young man or a boy, actually have any religious faith? Um, I, I'm terrified that someone here might have bought my book <laughs> and have read my answer to that question. If you haven't, by the way, it's available at fine bookstores. And so um, I'll, make it, I'll make it quick. I, I, I never did. Uh, I think a lot of people have the same experience as me. I, I, was not, I wasn't maltreated by any faith or any church or anything like that. Um, I didn't have a reverse Damascus of losing my faith. What I did was more like discover that I didn't believe. I think probably there are a fair number of people here who know what I'm talking about, who had the same experience. Um, the way I discovered it was this. I had a, a nice teacher called Mrs. Watts, an old trout, um, <laughs> when I was at a boys' school in Devonshire. And I must have been about 10. And she was our nature teacher, nature walks. Come on, boys, and show you different kinds of tree, flower. I used to know the difference. Um, <laughs> bird, um, that sort of thing. Um, but she was also our scripture teacher. Uh, I used to enjoy scripture lessons because it was my first... I didn't know this, but it was my first um, work as a literary critic. I was going through... <laughs> well, well, no, it was called Search the Scriptures. They'd give you a text on a piece of gummed paper that the government would send, because it was we're an officially Anglican country, the, my country of birth. Um, the Queen is the head of the church as well as the state. You know all this, and the armed forces. I hope she has a long life, if only because the moment she checks out her bat-eared, chinless, <laughs> resentful, Islam-fancying son will become the head of the church and the head of the state and the armed forces at that instant, which is what you get if you found a regime on the family values of Henry VIII. <laughs> but I digress again. Um, so the government would send these papers out, and you'd be given one and gum it in your little book and it would give it a, a chapter and a verse and you'd have to look that up and say what led up to and what led away from this verse. So the, they wouldn't give you the story, just the verse, and you'd have to tell of what story or parable uh, this verse was the culmination. Really well worth doing and taught you to do some close textual analysis. Um, one day Mrs. Watts made a fatal mistake and she, she tried to combine her scripture teaching with her nature teaching. And she said, swept away by faith, she said, and boys, you notice how beautiful the greenery is. The, the trees, the fields, the shrubs, the leaves, all, they're lovely shades of green, which she said is amazing because it's the color that's the most restful and lovely to our eyes. So God must be very good because, imagine if he'd made the leaves and the grass orange or, or purple or something really clashing and, and horrible to the eyes. But he didn't. He made it green, which is much nicer. And I thought, I was 10, I thought, that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know, I didn't know anything about chlorophyll, say, then, <laughs> or photosynthesis. In fact, I don't know that much about it now, or phototropism or natural selection or anything. I didn't know anything like that, and that no one had ever told me that it might not be true, what was in the Bible, so, but I thought, no, no, this, that's absolute nonsense. It's obvious to me. I knew the uh, eyes came after the trees. 
the natural uh, vegetation had been there before the human eye was. How I knew this, I don't know, but I did know it. Um, turns out to be true. Um, and I could never get over it. I started to notice more and more uh, discrepancies and um, uh, absurdities. And you know how it is, you can't be a little bit heretical. Um, that's partly why I favor compulsory religious instruction in schools. Because I know of no other way to guarantee the steady mass production of atheism among, among the young. Do you know, it, it never occurred to me when I asked that question, it was an invitation to recite the first chapter. No, well, there you go. But uh, you've, you've done so. But if you want, the you've hard copy so is still fine paperback version. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, uh, God is not great. I mean, you can tell, and everyone here can tell, that uh, your use of language is mesmerizing. The book is a, is a polemic, and as such, it's quite intoxicating as well, I think. But for this conversation, I've been looking for the flaws in your argument, and here's what I think the main one is. Um, you've exposed every conceivable facet of religion's capacity for evil, but you've made virtually no admissions at all about its capacity for good. So I wonder why you refuse to do that. Well, I thought there were enough books making that point. <laughs> um, so I would write one stressing the dark side of it, if you like. But I'm not going to pretend I don't know what you mean. I mean, it's, it is another question that I know I always know I'm going to be faced with, so I don't think I, I duck it so much as to try and anticipate it. My, the way I've resolved this, to try and make it um, condense, is this. Um, you have to point out to me, I've tried this with quite leading theologians and members of various religions and important clerical spokesmen. I said, you give me an example of a moral action taken or a moral statement made. I believe that because of their faith that I couldn't make as a person who doesn't have faith and I have not so far had anyone point such a thing out to me except the, the um, um, well let me come to that in a second because uh, I haven't yet had a convincing answer offered but the corollary question is this can you name me a wicked action undertaken or a wicked statement made by someone purely because of their religion, and you've already thought of one. Everyone here can think of one right away. And you've thought of another one, too, now you're thinking about it. <laughs> to answer my own question, um, I, I was once told, well, I've thought of something. It's a statement, and I said, okay, tell me. And it was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I said, yes, but I, by definition, couldn't make that statement. For obvious reasons. I mean, I, I'm not in the position of having such a father or being able to uh, make such an appeal to him. So it isn't, it isn't something I'm forbidden to do by faith. It's something no Christian could say either. Uh, but it was a good try. I have come up with a remark, because uh, I try very hard to, to argue against myself. And I, it came to me the other day that Lech Wałęsa, during the early struggle of the solidarity movement in Poland, was interviewed as the shipyards were being surrounded by the Polish militia and army and his little band of, of resistors and dissidents was in there with the, with the hard, fairly hard core of the Polish working class around it, but a perilous situation. And he was asked by an interviewer, aren't you scared, aren't you afraid? And he said with complete composure, he said, I'm not afraid of anyone but God. And I thought, well, I think that's a nonsensical statement, but I think it's a very noble one, and I wouldn't be able to make it. Um, it is a bit contextual, however. That was the favorite statement of General Edwin Walker, the right-wing crackpot who was the founder of the John Birch Society in the United States as well. The man who Lee Harvey Oswald practiced assassination on, in fact, first try. Um, dry run, you might say. Um, but I, I, I would have to say I'm, a, I'm aware of what a statement like that can mean to people. Well, indeed, in the same way as I'm aware of what a stained glass window or a psalm or um, a mosque can mean to people that, alas, it can't mean to me. Indeed. And there is a passage in your book, actually. I mean, you, you say that you can't think of something that you couldn't have done, a moral action that you couldn't have done without having religion. Fair enough. But you do, in your book, single out on one occasion, it seems to be the closest you've come to praising anybody who is overtly religious. It's Dr. Martin Luther King and what inspired him. And you write...